Support for Father David Abernethy and his ministry at the Pittsburgh Oratory of St. Philip Neri comes entirely from the donations of community members and listeners like you. The creation of future groups and podcast episodes depends on your commitment and generosity. We humbly ask that you consider a monthly gift of $10 to the Pittsburgh Oratory in support of Father David and his work. To make this or any gift, please visit www.thepittsburghoratory.org, click the Donate button, and write Father David in the Notes section. You can also make a recurring or one-time donation directly through Podbean. Your commitment and ministry-sustaining support are greatly appreciated. God bless you, and enjoy the podcast. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Okay, welcome back, everybody, to our study of the Ladder of Divine Ascent uh, by St. John Climacus. And as I mentioned before we started the group, it's fortuitous that uh, today is also the Feast of St. John Climacus. So providentially, we're able uh, to read from his work on his feast day. And we're picking up with uh, step number one still, and on renunciation of the world. And if you remember, we had been... Th- uh, thinking about the first three steps as one unit, all having to do with the break from the world. And so the first step is renunciation, the second detachment, and then the third exile. And certainly for the monk, uh, those would be done in a more sweeping and radical fashion. You know, the renunciation of the things of this world, uh, exile from the world and even from family, and uh, detachment uh, from uh, the, the pleasures of the world as well. And so a great deal of, as we'll see in what Climacus emphasizes here, uh, where we're picking up tonight, there was kind of courage, humility, and faith uh, that would be needed to be able to simply take the step, to be able to step forward and place oneself in the hands of of God, and to be able to let go of the things of the world and one's attachment to them in order to detach oneself to what had greater value to treat that relationship with God as it is, the pearl of great price, and be willing to sacrifice all to attain it. And so again, we're picking up at the bottom of page 55 with number nine. All who enter upon the good fight, which is hard and close, but also easy, must realize that they must leap into the fire if they really expect the celestial fire to dwell in them. But let everyone examine himself, and so let him eat the bread of it with its bitter herbs, and let him drink the cup of it with its tears, lest his service lead to his own judgment. If everyone who has been baptized has not been saved, I shall be silent about what follows. Okay, so as I mentioned, that there is a a great faith and courage that's needed to be able to make this step forward, but also discernment. that uh, along with what we read in the gospel, if one is going up against a a larger army, you seek to make peace terms, that you would discern well the the reality that stands before you. And so John would have those who would be considering the monastic life, especially this kind of monastic life, to discern well the path that lies ahead of them uh, with all that it is going to cost them. So to eat the bread with its bitter herbs and drink the cup Uh, with his tears, to know something of the cross of that life and uh, its participation in the passion before taking that step forward. Uh, Because simply embracing the life is no guarantee uh, of salvation or one sanctity. You know, one could easily enter into that life and uh, be lazy within it or negligent and not really live it to all of its fullness, not truly give one's heart over to it. And so in the last phrase, he says, if everyone who has been baptized has not been saved, I shall be silent about what follows, meaning that uh, there's no need for me to mention, as it were, uh, that not everyone who enters the monastic life is guaranteed of salvation, 
that it is one step to enter into it. It certainly involves a lot more to embrace it in its fullness, uh, to really give one's heart over to God in this way, but be willing to make the sacrifices that lie ahead, uh, including rising up the, each of the rungs of the ladder. Okay? So he, he doesn't shrink away from presenting to them the real challenge of this life. And I think uh, simply along those lines, I think we can learn from John in terms of how we speak about the faith and how we look at the faith as a whole, that uh, so often I think the, the challenge of the life as well as what it offers is uh, not put forward fu fully whether it's in our sharing faith with others or those opportune moments where we have, can speak about the faith or from the pulpit, uh, that people tend not to be attracted to those things that, uh, that really don't really speak to the depths of their heart or speak to who they are as human beings. And uh, if, so if we water down Christianity, if we water down the gospel along with this challenge, we, in some sense, weaken it. You know, I think Paul experienced this on some level too, and we've discussed this in some previous groups in terms of his own preaching, that when he began to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, uh, that there was something about this that pierced the hearts of those who heard him uh, and spoke to their hearts, both of the love of God, uh, but also of the challenge that was set before them in terms of living out the faith. And it was then that he began to gain converts I think as he, as he approached preaching more on a philosophical level, if you remember, he began preaching to the Greeks, uh, that a lot of that did not bear much fruit, at least initially, for him, uh, until he began to preach, uh, preach more about the cross. Okay, number 10. Those who would enter this contest must renounce all things, despise all things, deride all things, and shake off all things, that they may lay a firm foundation. A good foundation of three layers and three pillars is innocence, fasting, and temperance. That all babes in Christ begin with these virtues, taking as their model the natural babes. For you never find in them anything sly or deceitful, they have no insatiate appetite, no insatiate stomach, insatiable stomach, no body of fire or raging like a beast. But perhaps as they grow, in proportion as they take more food, their natural passions also increase. So, you know, as novices in the spiritual life, that we would seek to embrace these fundamental virtues that point us back to those who are true babes on the natural level that there is a kind of innocence that we are to have in entering into this and acknowledgement of our need and dependence upon God to strengthen us and to nourish us uh, with the grace that is needed to live it. Uh, with f fasting, so there at this, you know, children have uh, no insatiable, as it were, insatiate appetite, you know, as uh, certainly they have appetites and a lot of mothers here would probably uh, take issue with uh, what John is saying here, but in, in the sense that, uh, you know, as we grow older and as we, you know, feed ourselves, we often begin to feed ourselves for a lot of different reasons, more than simply bodily hunger or the need of our bodies, but uh, for a lot of emotional region, reasons too. We can eat angrily or we can eat to feed depression. We can eat to feed anxiety. Uh, and so there are a lot of different re reasons that we can become insatiable in, in our appetites. Uh, similarly, he says they're not sly or deceitful. And so, you know, the, they don't have a kind of duplicity. You know, in their innocence, they express pretty much what is going on within them. An infant, you know, when they cry, they're all tears. And when they laugh, they're all laughter. There's no... Uh, putting on of mask and as it were, or pretending uh, at, at this point in, in their development. And, and so in some ways we, we have to become as Christ says, little children in the truest sense of the word uh, with this kind of innocence uh, of heart and of mind, of our appetites 
uh, that our body is not on fire or raging like a beast. And so, you know, all the appetites that we have, you know, whether it's our appetite for food or worldly goods or sexual appetites, uh, these haven't uh, taken hold of us in the sense of being a passion and uh, taken grip of us so that they begin to control our lives. And so infants can still be formed and shaped uh, in terms of their embrace of their identity as human beings. And so when entering into, whether it's the monastic life or entering into this pursuit of holiness that John is placing before us, we, we, we want to enter into it almost as it were with a cl clean slate, you know, that we allow ourselves as it were to be a blank screen and allow or, or clay, allow God to form us in the way that he desires. And so not to resist the action of his grace in our lives, to have such a trust, such an innocence that we truly place ourselves in his hands. So this renouncing of the things of the world is not a kind of hatred simply for worldly goods uh, or demonizing them. I think the greater desire for us is, is rooted in a relational reality that we desire to give ourselves over to God and have nothing that is an impediment to that reality, nothing that would get in the way of our seeing the depth of God's love or responding to his will in our life. And so in every way, we seek to enter into this life and, re and remain in this life as, as an infant before him, as a child before him. Any comments so far on the, on the first two paragraphs? And so fundamentally, you know, we know that John is writing for monastics, but I think he speaks more fully to simply the, our, our, the gifts that have come to us through our baptism, the universal call to holiness that we have all received, and uh, how we are to stand and see ourselves as standing before God as we enter into the spiritual life. And, you know, we've talked much in the past about the, the tendency in our day to sort of fit within the life of the world, to conform ourselves to the world, to, as it almost were to go unrecognized. And, uh, you know, often I think we fear this, the vulnerability of this, of what he puts forward, this kind of innocence, uh, living within a world that is so often sly and deceitful or violent uh, or so focused upon worldly goods that we could fear what would become of us and what would our life in this wor wor world really be like if we were to give ourselves over to God uh, in this unfettered and unrestrained way. And so I think this is why John in the previous paragraph says, what is needed is great courage, faith, and humility to be able to do this, to, to make this kind of abandonment to God, to be able to trust in his love so deeply. And, you know, it's beautiful, I think, to read within the ascetics, you know, there's never this kind of detachment from that relational aspect of things. They're not just taking up these practices or renouncing these things in an abstract way that it's abstracted from the relationship with God or the relationship or the, the, the holiness that we've been called to, the holiness of life in him. And uh, we've talked before about sometimes in Lent, we have this tendency to do that, to see our disciplines as a kind of endurance for 40 days, rather than a means to help us uh, overcome any laziness or negligence in our entering into this relationship of love that we've been called to. And if, if there's anyone who's going to set us on fire, it's, I think it's going to be John Conquest. In fact, he says as much, you know, we have to leap into the fire if there's a hope within us of being taken over by that celestial fire, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit that not only purifies the mind and heart, but sets us on fire with love of God and love of others. Okay. Any comments or we'll move along. All right. Number 11, paragraph 11, to lag in the fight 
act at the very outset of the struggle and thereby to furnish a token of our coming slaughter is a very hateful and dangerous thing. A firm beginning will certainly be useful for us when we later grow slack. The soul that is strong at first, but then relaxes, is spurred on by the memory of its former zeal. And in this way, new wings are often obtained. I've always loved this paragraph <laughs> because I think we have a tendency to approach the spiritual life in a minimalist fashion. And uh, even as priests, I think there's a tendency uh, to underestimate the action of God's grace in people's lives and the understanding of the need, I think, to stir this kind of zeal and desire for the Lord in the spiritual life, that one would not be indiscriminate in that, of course. But nonetheless, I think in terms of what is held out uh, to others, what the faith offers, but also the challenge of it is what uh, is necessary right, right from the beginning. And so even if as one is paying attention to the limits of another's or our own abilities, that there should be something uh, of our embrace of the life that is challenging, the depth of our prayer life, the practice of fasting, participating in the liturgy, going to confession regularly, that these are all the, the practices that we would want to enter into with as much zeal as possible, that right from the beginning, we would not lag as it were in the race, but seek to, to run forward as swiftly as we can to take hold of the gift of the spirit that has been given to us. And we don't want to squelch that within ourselves or in others of, out of a, a, a false sense of, uh, you know, this, a false sense of weakening the body or, you know, uh, or sort of hurting ourselves in some way physically or emotionally. In fact, John warns about that within this, within this step, that uh, we don't want to pamper ourselves to the extent that we lose all zeal for the Lord, that on some level we should feel it tangibly in our very being as we're striving for the Lord. And in the past, we've talked about this in, in light of the ascetical life, that in every other area of our life, when we enter into a particular discipline and when we are seeking to develop an aptitude, we engage in it fully as an expression of our love and true desire for it. And so we can never have our entrance into the spiritual battle be lacking in that fire of desire for the Lord. If we've, if we've, as we've said so much in the past, the desire is an in, is a integral part of the spiritual life that we know that we lack completeness outside of that relationship with God, then our, the way that we enter into the spiritual life is going to be reflective of that, that we've come to see that in and through the eyes of faith. And so we run towards him. And our ability to do that might be limited, depending on how we've lived our life. But nonetheless, we, we run towards him and we strive to, to run along that, that narrow path. Uh, in some of the other groups, I mentioned this little story about uh, a bishop topic, talking to his young seminarians and priests, and he said, never become so worried about getting burned out that you never catch fire. That, you know, our, our society, especially when it comes to the spiritual life, says, don't push yourself too much. Don't weaken yourself too much. Don't become a fanatic. And in the process, we, we squelch uh, I think the, the desire for the Lord and the enthusiasm for, for life within him. And if we set out, John tells us, in the spiritual life lacking this zeal, you know, if we lag in, in our sense of running forward, then when we run into difficulties in the future, when we feel our zeal begin to wane, or when we begin to undergo certain trials or we experience turmoil, then at least at that point, we'll, we will have the memory of our initial zeal for the Lord and that this can inflame us once again in order to, to drive us forward. Whereas if we've never had that, then, you know, ultimately a person can fall away from the faith, you know, a, you know, a faith that is lukewarm and cool or just mere embers, you know, but at the first experience of trial, will grow cold altogether. 
And this is what John does not want to ha happen. He knows what lies ahead for these men and does not want them to lose sight of that. Anthony. Father, um, I'd like to suggest maybe a slight alternative. C.S. Lewis had in his children's series about Narnia, the character Puddle Glum, certainly <laughs> not very on fire for anything, but surely very determined and very courageous. Maybe some of this is a matter of temperament, mm -hmm. like how I would be very zealous at one point, and then I'd say, wait a minute, what am I knocking myself out for? You know, maybe you got to scale it back, but without a culture to help regulate you, um, you run into problems. So I wonder if slow and steady wins the, way, the race, determination, maybe can play a part in this, or am I wrong? You're the priest. Uh, I think you're wrong. <laughs> Just, okay. No, I see what you're saying, and I understand that, and that's why I think I preface what, what I said, that in accord with a person's abilities, that the zeal and that they would enter into the spiritual life would be reflective of that, and that it would be, that they would be guided by the counsel of another who lives a life and can help them discern that. But there should always, I think, be within the heart, the sense of desire again, and that our pursuit of the Lord should be reflective of that. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, a person is going, again, to take on fasting like the monks of the desert would fast after many years of engaging in it. That, but nonetheless, they would take up a certain level of fasting because it is something that we see as essential to the ascetic life and the spiritual life as a whole. And so to lag would be, you know, not to give some free rein to that zeal and to, to narrow the person's focus to the point that it becomes myopic, so, so narrow that they only see one aspect of the life of, of faith in that relationship with God, rather than presenting them, I think, with the fullness of that that life and in particular that's a difficulty in our own day because I, I you know we are given these little elements of of the spiritual life that there's a disconnect from the spiritual tradition in a sense that people begin to pick and choose various elements and in the end it does not sustain them and I, I think so to present a person from the beginning this is what the the path forward looks like and this is what John is doing in these 30 steps and he doesn't varnish it, doesn't water it down, but presents it fully to others, while at the same time encouraging them. Ascend, brothers, ascend eagerly, he tells them within the text. And I think the church and, uh, you know, and within our own hearts and as we encourage others, it would be with the same uh, kind of language. Because what we are pursuing is not akin to anything within this world nor do we want to put it on the same level. I think if anything, that these first three steps show us that what we are entering into is of greater value than anything within this world. That what we are, are promised is everything. It's life in God, but what is asked of us is everything, to give our hearts to him fully. And to communicate something less than that to others who are entering into the faith and the spiritual life is to do them harm. I think it's a kind of injustice because we aren't presenting to them the fullness, the fullness of the faith. And, you know, I think I mentioned Fulton Sheen last time saying, you know, so many people leave the Catholic faith. But what it turns out to be is that they're not really leaving the Catholic faith. It's what has been presented to them or their interpretation of it. This is a very limited, sometimes obscured vision of it, or a vision that has been obscured by others and the, the lukewarmness with which it has been lived. And so our going back to the scriptures or going back to the fathers is meant to set us on, on fire for the love of God. And uh, that favorite image from, my favorite image, I should say, from uh, the, the fathers, it's, I believe it's Abba Joseph and Abba Lot, 
you know, the young one who comes to me and said, you know, what must I do, Father, you know, in living out the life? I've kept the rule. I've kept, you know, both, you know, the fasting rules, the prayer rules. You know, I've stayed in my cell and have prayed. And the elder turns around and he holds up his hands and they become like lanterns of fire. And he says, why not become all fire? That, you know, he presents something to him there that goes beyond this, you know, dutiful practice of certain disciplines or even living a good life in, a, in accord with our own judgment and sensibilities. And he's presenting to him the reality of life in God, you know, the, the end point deific deification, that our, our life is to present to be, to uh to share in the life of god and to share in something of that fire of the holy spirit and he shows him this in a very concrete way and i think by the way that we live our our lives th this is what should be made manifest to the world as well and that doesn't necessarily mean you know destroying the body in an indiscreet way but it does mean how is it that you know, we are considered about how we prioritize our day that we don't place the relationship with God on an equal footing with all the other things on our daily list to do. You remember uh, uh, Elder Lazarus from the desert, the, who's, they made a little video of him, the, the last anchorite. And he says that, you know, if we pray a little bit in the morning and we pray a little bit at night, you know, and we go to divine liturgy every once in a while or confession every once in a while, then the faith is an auxiliary construction, you know, that it's a psychological construct. And I think we all know how easy it is for us to slip into this, you know, uh, relationship with God and treat it like a comfortable old shoe or pair of jeans, you know, that we wouldn't part with. It's comfortable. It gives us a sense of security. A blankie, if we want to take it all the way back to this sort of childlike uh, imagery, you know, that we hold on to is a sense of, with the, because it gives us a sense of security, but not really taking hold of what God offers us as made possible for us and calls us to. And certainly, you know, John, in speaking to those, you know, at the foot of the ladder, you know, wanting them to consider well what it is that they're about to do. Is this what they desire? Is what they are they truly longing for God, or is there another reason that they've come there? Sam and then Maureen. Hi, Father. Um, How are you? <laughs> doing great. Uh, so uh, there's been a resurgence of interest I'm, as I'm listening to. to, to you, I'm, I'm reminded of the resurgence of interest in uh, the Thomistic teaching related to effeminacy as being like a, a pervasive problem within uh, the world today. And within the Thomistic sense, it's not, it's different than how it's, that word is typically used um, in the common sense today. And instead, you know, it is the attachment to pleasure that uh, makes a person unwilling to undergo uh, arduous labor to pursue a good. Right. And, and so that's supposed to be a, a vice against a man being brought to perfection in his masculinity and a part of that masculinity being pursuing good through arduous labor. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, because it seems like on one hand, what I'm wondering whether the Desert Fathers have a word that isn't specific to you know, masculinity or femininity but uh, would be an appropriate um, word that means something similar to in terms of what you're describing, and and I guess the, the sin to sort of pray against, so to speak, uh, uh, and to avoid, but within the Desert Fathers context. Right. Well, I think even the word virtue itself, virtues, you know, there's man manliness, you know, that there is a kind of courage that is needed there. But John actually has a, a complete step dedicated to unmanly fears. And, you know, the, the title's not uh, very PC, but I think what he's getting at here is that there is a kind of courage and strength that is needed in entering into the spiritual life, realizing that it is a spiritual battle and we have to be prepared for the battle that lies ahead. 
and that this courage is needed in the spiritual life and lacking it and lacking the, the faith that is the foundation of it, uh, then a person becomes afraid of their own shadow, he says. And, uh, and so we have to enter into the battle without the fear of being wounded. And uh, even here in this step, well, he, he uses that image of a plucky fighter that, you know, we can't enter into the battle, uh, you know, being timid, you know, because the, the demons are going to see that. Uh, and then very easily we are going to be let off of the spiritual life. Uh, but if we enter into it, realizing you know, not with a sense of being invulnerable by our own strength, but realizing that we are strengthened by the grace of God. And we enter into that spiritual battle fully, holding nothing back, a plucky, as plucky fighters, resolute, it's in this translation, resolute fighters, so that we en enter into it with a firm resolve to remain steadfast. And so I think if John would say something comparable to what you're describing with Thomas, he goes into great detail with it throughout the entire ladder, but here on these first steps, and in particular on that step on unmanly uh, on, on fears, which I can't remember the number of it at this point, but, uh, but it's a wonderful, a wonderful step, certainly, and important for our own day. Because I think there is this kind of hesitancy and, you know, it's um, not necessarily out of fault, more so, I think, out of uh, a lack of formation. You know, the, we often will praise natural forms of courage that we see manifest on any number of fields, you know, of, of athletes, whatever it might be, someone who really you know, goes that extra mile and you know, spends himself or uh, in a military way, you know, a soldier who, you know, lays down his life for, you know, his fellow soldiers or becomes wounded in saving them, that we will acknowledge that and hold it up as something to emulate. But uh, in the spiritual life, you know, we've, I think, lost sight of that. And part of it is our, the breakdown of the, the culture within the life of, of the church itself, not the, our failure to hold up even image, the images of the saints. You know, with the, this last Sunday commemorating St. John Climacus, you know, I thought, I was thinking of that in part, that you don't find many churches. In fact, I don't think I've ever found a church named after St. John Climacus. And I don't know if I've come across a church that has an icon of the ladder within it. You know, I've seen many icons of the ladder, but not with, you know, within the churches them, themselves. And, uh, and so on so many levels, we aren't holding up these images uh, uh, of the saints and the martyrs as those who become these living icons for us of this kind of courage and fidelity. In fact, you know, the question that often comes to people's mind is how could a good God or loving God ask this of individuals or that they would undergo such suffering? There were two saints, uh, uh, they slipped the name, uh, uh, the second one's name was B and the first one was M. It was yesterday, I think it was, I'm sorry, but they were both martyrs and they under uh, they were crushed basically to death between two pieces of of wood, you know, ultimately is how they were put to death. They were tortured. And yet when often those, uh, those of us Christian or not in our modern sensibilities look at that and we think, you know, we shake our heads and we think, thank goodness I don't live in that age or, you know, it's, it doesn't come into our mind to desire it, that we would be willing to, to lay down our lives for Christ and desire to do so for the faith. Whereas you find those in the military that, you know, that this kind of desire to protect their country and this willingness to do so. And we see those even like within the Ukraine now who are staying within their country, even at the cost of their, their life to protect, you know, the, their country and their people. And we, we, can, we can sort of look at that and see the heroism and courage there. But when we look at it on a life, in terms of the life of faith, for some reason, it does not 
ring true within the heart. One of my favorite stories, and I'm sorry for those who've been in my past groups, I'm repeating myself <laughs> again, but one of the priests who was instrumental in my coming into the faith told this story that when he was a little boy, his mom asked him what he wanted to do when he grow, grew up. And she expected him to say something like, I want to be a dentist or a doctor or something like that. And he was sort of precocious in his life of faith. He had it real clarity. And he blurts out to her, I want to be a martyr. And she gets a shocked look on her face and she yells at him, don't you ever say that again. You know, it, it, was, it was like he had said that he wanted to, you know, be a mobster or something like that, you know, that he had uh, said the worst possible thing that she could imagine. And, I you know, on, on a natural level, we understand her motherly sensibilities of being horrified at the idea of her little boy wanting to, you know, die for the faith. But he had this holy innocence and even a kind of holy boldness as a little child to be able to say, yes, this is what I understand is the height of Christian dignity is the willingness to lay down oneself in love for others. And so that's, that's my highest ideal. That's what I want to be. And this often isn't proclaimed in our own day. You know, our failure to preach, priest, failure to preach about the saints or uh, parents not educating their, their children in the lives of the saints, you know, is, or reading to them about the, the lives of the saints. I think all, all these ways, I think, strip us of some of the, the resolve that John is already speaking of here. Okay. All right. Great. Maureen, you have to take yourself off mute. I was just going to say, isn't it the Holy Spirit that really puts that fire in us? Because I seem like everyone I've met, but, you know, when you find meet them, they're 80 and they know the Lord, they have this, this serene peace and they almost become childlike. Mm -hmm. Like you could tell them anything like, oh, well, the Lord's going to take care of that. Don't even worry about it. like, you're like, oh my gosh. Well, it seems with it, it, like it's like a growth pattern. And I always think of the Holy Spirit is like, he comes in and he's like a furniture mover, you know? Things that have to go, they start getting tossed out. And the more you surrender to those things, like the what the world is, it seems you have more peace. But I think it's a long journey and you go up and down. Well, it's a long journey. You know, I think when I when I think of my grandparents, you know, both were immigrants mm -hmm. and you know, one from Poland, one from France, and they both had hard lives. Yeah. And so they weren't getting a, going to get in a twist over small things you know they've been through you know my grandfather served a couple tours in world war one oh. you know my grandmother came over from france and never saw her mother again so they knew i mean they knew what exile and renunciation and detachment was all about because of the reality of their life and the difficulties and hardship of it and there was something of that that formed and and shaped them and so sometimes it's not always a guarantee i mean that you know, those things that you, you mentioned could, and I mentioned, could lead a person to bitterness outside of the context of faith and that relationship with God. And so I think, again, we always want to connect these two together, you know, that what gives us hope and what allows us to endure to the end, persevere to the end, is our trust in the promises of God yeah. and as, of his mercy and grace. So it's not simply that it comes about naturally. It does come about by the gift of the Spirit, by the gift of God's grace. And uh, before we go to Joseph here, I saw Rachel. Rachel, you got to stop doing this. Put your hand up and be bold. You still have your question? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get off mute and laughing. So, okay. I'll stop. <laughs> I'll stop doing that. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. Uh, two things. One, you mentioned, you know, the innocence that I think, you know, if one hasn't lost it, you know, throughout their life and, and they've retained their, mm -hmm. their baptismal and that inner is innocence, oh, yeah. um, like a St. Therese, mm -hmm. you know, that that's beautiful. Um, also, the the innocence that I think comes about through living the life that St. John is talking about 
is not always, I, I can imagine it, it wouldn't always be received well or even seen as that by others. Mm -hmm. um, but if, I think through reading St. John, which, which I've read before, um, and applying his teachings, if more people got to know St. John Climacus and the steps, and as you were saying, I think they would really start to discern or be able to discern and realize that um, the spiritual life is not this cookie cutter um, idea of what you have in your head, and it's not, it's going to look different for every single person. It's right. going to manifest itself in other ways. And so you'll approach others with humility, as I've heard you say before, and our Lord with humility that I would hope, I was hoping that you could touch on that. Okay. That was a lot. But uh, no, that's okay. But, uh, you know, I think, you know, Christian virtue is not just those natural virtues with a little shot of grace, you know, a little, you know, it's, you know, allowing oneself, it's Christ living within us. And so it's being transformed in the most radical possible way that we receive him in the Holy Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity. It is his spirit that dwells within us. So we become temples of God, the most high. And so we need, I think, in a sense, to move away from looking at even the life of virtue as climbing up a ladder or climbing up a mountain in the sense of, you know, as we grow in our natural aptitudes, really what is taking place through this striving that John puts before us using the image of the latter is this abandonment of oneself over to God more and more fully and exercising that faith in a deeper and deeper way until we have put on the mind of Christ that we are really living for him and that he is living within us without any or putting any impediment uh, you know in in the way of that reality uh, in regards to what you said in, in the sense of the innocence, you know, that the innocence that is to be ours is, again, you know, this radical trust in God, that we are sons and daughters in the Son, and that, you know, we've already talked about in the Evergetinos about the fundamental virtue of, of obedience, you know, that we seek to do the will, our food is to do the will of our Heavenly Father. And so we become uh, children of God in Christ. And that, you know, that we hunger to do the Father's will and we are nourished on the doing of it and being obedient to it. And so we are to be conformed in every way. This is the holy innocence that is to be ours is that of Christ himself. And so it's not childishness, it's childlikeness. And we're not called to be petulant, you know, you know, and I think sometimes the, you know, being a child of Christ is often put in that way or envisioned in that way. Uh, but it's, we're called to be sons and daughters in the son, you know, this uh, desire to do the father's will to please the father, that this, this is what forms and shapes us and what was the third thing that you had touched upon innocence was the second was there oh, a third? I, think it, I think it how we approach um, others that living this life and how yes. we approach others and our lord with humility that's where, right yeah that's what i was hoping you would touch right. upon i think well. by, by seeking to live it you know, that a person isn't argued into the faith. The faith is a gift. And, you know, it comes through seeing it in the concrete way in the other or experiencing the love of, of Christ within the other. And in the eyes of the world, we will probably seem like fools. And so the humility comes into play in the sense of not clinging to our own, you know, dignity or identity insofar as it's been shaped by the world 
the clinging to our dignity as it's found in Christ and, and having that be so deeply formed within us that we are able to manifest, you know, not ourselves or allow ourselves to, to uh, allow ourselves to sort of uh, block the field of vision of others in terms of their seeing the, the love that's revealed in Christ. That we should so live for him that every word, every thought, indeed, every encounter we have with another bears witness to Christ. And, you know, we've, especially in the West, in our tendency at times to intellectualize the faith and to make it notional, we get into these arguments about the faith, and I think they go nowhere most of the time. You know, it's one thing to take an opportune moment to seek to articulate the faith as well as we can, to, to lay it out for those who might be interested. But I, I think in essence, you know, what is guiding those discussions typically is a kind of aggression, and it manifests itself pretty clearly in our day. Mm. And so I think the loving encounter with the other and the gentleness of spirit, mm -hmm. you know, these are the things that bear witness to the love of the kingdom. I, I think that's the connection that I was looking for is, is instead of, it's not just arguing people into the faith, but treating the spiritual life as, it, as if it is a ladder, as you mentioned, to be climbed and waiting and being patient for our Lord and realizing that all grace comes from him and that's our approach that it's that we need um before god and before others as well and so we can't look at another person and say well you're at this step sure. you must be at this step but that we have to in this moment our lord is here present in this moment and to realize that and acknowledge that and live that that's right um, there, there is okay. there is this i'm sorry there is this kind of synergy that the fathers speak of you know living in that moment and taking hold of that grace and acting upon it but the emphasis as you said is is, is on the grace of god and i think this is where that holy innocence is maintained that we know our dependence upon god and his grace at every moment and so any good that we do, any kindness that we show is by the grace of God. And so we have no illusions that it's simply by our own strength. Joseph. Uh, hi, Father. Hi, everybody. Um, I just, I'm really struck by this dichotomy that you just mentioned here. This, on the one hand, part of what we've been talking about from what St. John has just mentioned was this striving but then on this other hand there's this surrender and dependence that's sometimes that seems like a hard balance to or a hard thing to get right because you oscillate at least i do between muscling up or you know just coasting and um it, it, you mentioned fulton sheen and i don't remember the context actually that you mentioned but he has this great story or this great line about um, the woman with the alabaster jar. Mm -hmm. And he makes a point that she uh, just broke the jar right. completely. Whereas we would um, tend to want to piece it out drop by drop. Right. Uh, he even right. says, as if to indicate by the slowness of our giving, the generosity of our gift. Um, so he is talking about this sort of all in attitude right and there's a great uh, he gives this great talk to a group of school children mm -hmm. um you can find it on youtube i could put the link in the comics uh, comments called wasting your life mm -hmm. and the whole talk is about how people tend to live below the level of their energy mm -hmm. and 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 he tries to make this point about how it, it, there's a paradox in that we seem to understand it in the natural world mm -hmm. you know people like athletes will will do this incredible disciplining of their body but there's this strange thing that keeps us from doing that in the supernatural world and i've noticed that like when i if i get up really early to go somewhere sometimes i notice people get up super early to go out hunting 
mm -hmm. around here or where I'm from. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if they get up that early to go to like, you know, morning for, you know, or the, you know, some divine office or something like that. And I don't know, is that just our fallen nature that we're, I think you know, so. I mean, yeah. I think in our focus upon the things of this world, I was struck by that too in seminary. When I was in seminary, I drive, I commuted back and forth. So I was going the opposite way of the traffic and I'd be the only one headed out of the city, but there would be miles and miles of traffic pe of people entering into the city before sunup. And it was always, every day, it was this concrete image for me of, you know, where people's energy Tend, tends to be focused. And the images that you use and Sheen uses, I think are perfect. You know, the lavishness of her love and breaking the, the jar of ointment or nard. And we see the gospels are replete with images like this. The elderly woman, you know, Jesus is out teaching in the heat and he comes in, they sit down in the temple area where people are making their donations to the upkeep of the temple. And so there are people are coming in and making their donations. This old widow comes in and throws her two last coppers in. And he jumps to his feet and basically says, this, this is the love of the kingdom. Her two last, you know, coins, you know, her sustenance, what she would eat with given that day is a reflection of the love of the kingdom. And so you're right. I mean, I think, this this is what we are being called to and i and even in our initial response john would not have us lose sight of that that god is offering us everything and our response from the beginning he wants to have this kind of quality to it that we aren't measuring it out because when when we undergo trials in the future you know, the memory of measuring out drop by drop is not going to fill us once again with a zeal for the Lord. But also, you know, when we are measuring it out, we are never allowing ourselves to be filled with the grace that God desires to give us. You know, in your in your lap will be poured forth all, all of this that will be pressed down and overflowing. This is what is promised to us. To give ourselves fully, we will never be lacking in fact the opposite the more that we give of ourselves the more that we receive we are told and so th this is simply what john i think is trying to foster within those who are beginning this journey and this is true for us whether we're living in the world or living the monastic life and jos can you help me out here is your is your uh mike working tonight is it joseph or it's working. No, it's not. Oh, oh man. <laughs> Sorry. I'm wrong. Sorry. Um, Is yeah. it Josie or? No. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I'm good. Okay. Um, my question is a little bit, um, it's kind of um, similar to somebody else's, but I'll try to frame it in my own okay. way. Basically, um, I'm thinking just about, in my mind, there seems to be a little bit of a dichotomy between the spirituality of someone like Saint Therese of Lisieux and like the the fathers and my I'm, I'm going to be trying to be more specific because I, I just wonder if uh, you you said in the beginning that there's this question which is why does God require or need suffering from us um, and I and I worry or I wonder if we can look at this in a way that is um, you know, you can look at it in a way that's purgative. Is it just you're being cleansed by the suffering, which is that what the fathers are doing? But then you see a lot of the saints and you also see Jesus like suffering, not just as this, like, I don't want to say punishment, but as this, um, um, yeah, I mean, maybe it could be like, a, not a, I don't want to use that word, but purgative sort of suffering versus, um, and, and so, there's that right and then we are we are advised in the face of suffering to accept it and this is god's will and all of that and then there's the level of the fathers who in some way bring suffering into their lives so it isn't just them sort of accepting what's given to them but it's pursuing suffering to a certain extent um and you see this with like a lot of sense and you mentioned this like people who are basically opening themselves up to like want suffering like i think saint ignatius of loyola says also something about that. Like he's not even, he said, I'm not worthy of the suffering 
that you're giving me. So he's, you know, he's talking about it's this flowery language about like being in love with, you know, so you see this with the saints, but then you see um, saints like Saint Therese who, who don't really focus that much on suffering, who, who don't really, I mean, it seems to me her spirituality, I know she suffers a lot, but her spirituality is always focused on love and like the little way and like, it's not this massive battle. You're, you're, when you think of her, you don't really think of a spirituality of battle and combat and all of that. You're, you think more of her, it seems to me, I mean, I might be wrong about this, but it seems to me she's more about sort of giving herself and like loving Jesus and opening up her heart to love others, but it's not suffering focused. And it's also not, seems to me not, it's not focused like the father so much on what you're trying to correct this, I think in our minds, but it's not focused on this like ladder, this ascent, this, this, you know, and I think this is a little bit mirroring what somebody was saying about this dichotomy mm -hmm. between letting go and surrender and love, but also battle and all of that. I don't know. It may be the simplest way to ask this question is why does God, I mean, you said it's like, maybe this is like a heathen question, but like, why is it that God needs or wants even suffering from us? Right. Yeah. I think you are a bit of a heathen, but that's, that's okay. You can be a part of the group anyway. <laughs> uh no i think your qu question is a great one and you know i think we could come at it from a number of, of of directions you know we have to remember that there's a you know popularized vision of therese of lesu uh and uh, you know the her her autobiography in particular the story of the soul and you know this simple way this childlike way uh which, which is beautiful and is emphasizing i think this you know relying upon the love of god and abandoning oneself to the love of god but we also have to remember that uh, therese was a carmelite and so she was not you know sitting on the couch and watching television she was living the discipline of the Car carmelite life that would have been reflective of a lot of what John was saying here in terms of the ascetical life and striving to overcome, you know, the, the, the passions and grow in virtue and prayer. And there would have been great discipline to it. And, uh, and if you ever read her final conversations, her last conversations with her sisters when she was dying of tuberculosis, I think it gives a much clearer insight into Therese's whole spirituality including her understanding of suffering uh, than what we would pick up in, say, the story of the soul. And uh, there's some of the most beautiful readings I've, I've read, you know, these little conversations between her and her sister in those last, those, you know, last weeks of her life, but uh, they do present us a full, fuller picture. And another work to read on her would be the complete spiritual doctrine of St. Therese by Jamart, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's uh, a French writer, so it's J J A M A R T. I think is, is how it's pronounced or, or how it's spelled. But in any ways, I think he tr he tries to address her spirituality in a far more complete way than what the popular vision of Therese often does put before us. I think what she did capture, again, is this kind of holy innocence and trust and dependence upon the love of God, that is love that transforms. It's not an asceticism that is detached from this love or even on an equal footing with that, that love. And there's some interesting letters that pass between her and these priests that were going off to the missions who are going to end up being martyred for the faith as well, where she's telling them, we'll see who reaches this level of sanctity, you by your asceticism or me by this path of simple, simple love and trust, that she knew that this radical reliance upon the grace of God and abandonment to that love was the thing that was transformative and sanctifying. But it by no means, though, did she uh, set apart, set aside you know, the, the reality of, that we struggle with as human beings. I think in some ways, you know, Therese was, because her life was so short, things become telescoped, I think, in terms of her spiritual development and growth, and also in terms of how we look at her life. 
and her her spiritual development the things that she experienced and in that sense we tend to minimize the fuller experience that someone like therese had within the spiritual life and the trials that she underwent within the context of the carmel and so i don't think that there is this kind of wide divide between the two of them i think one of the reasons that therese has made a doctor of the church is that she clarifies for us the primacy of of divine love in shaping uh, our view of ourselves, our view of life, and including our view of suffering. Precisely that we might not see, as we often do, as suffering is something that is abstracted from that relationship of radical intimacy with God. That there is nothing that we suffer as human beings in isolation. If we believe that we become one with God in and through our baptism, through the gift of the Eucharist, the gift of his own spirit, then we are participating in the most radical way then in the redemptive work of the cross and that our suffering is united to his own and seen as, you know, intimately part of his own. And I think part of what, what distorts reality for us or or people's perception of christianity as being this kind of masochistic desire for suffering is that it is often abstracted from this deep relationship of intimacy with god and what he has created and made possible for us by the embrace of our humanity through the incarnation all the way through the cross and resurrection that this is fundamentally changed how we see ourselves as human beings, our experience of God and our identity and destiny in Christ. And so, you know, Therese captured that in a beautiful way, but she's certainly not the only one who captured that. And I think the Desert Fathers capture it, but I think that they are often viewed through this other lens uh, of being somehow being extremist or those who had this hatred of the body and the self and that their ascetical life was devoid of desire. And I think what you, all the people in this group who've been going through the fathers, I, Isaac the Syrian, John Cassian, and now Climacus and so many others that desire is the language of the ascetical life, that one is longing for God, longing for the completeness that he alone can offer us. And the ascetical life is what, again, removes any impediment to that reality that allows us to exercise that faith, uh, belief in this intimacy with the divine that we are called to. And I, I think often sort of this division or this sort of setting up, uh, you know, maybe some of the Eastern saints uh, as opposed to the Western or ascetic and some of the mystical uh, writers like John of the Cross or, you know, of Teresa of Avila is sort of people not really entering into their writings and their lives very deeply to see what really shaped them. And I think that's just part and parcel of our own day that we pick and choose things of people's lives and their writings that speak to us on one level without really immersing ourselves in the fullness of their life. This is why we've changed this group to go into the fullness of the corpus of the writings of the people that we're considering so that we don't do that. We aren't just reading the things that are interesting to us or that aren't offensive to our sensibilities, but we allow ourselves and our view of what it is to be a human being in relationship, to be God, with, in relationship to, with God to be challenged. I don't know if that's helpful or did I muddy the waters? No, it's it's helpful. I think you said something that kind of is the heart of it, maybe, is you said like we participate in the in the in like in the suffering of, of like God Himself. Mm -hmm. So if, what I'm getting from that is I understand this is like something kind of mysterious and you, you can't really just kind of give me the answer. I, I I get that. But it seems to me like maybe then what you're saying is. Like there's something inherently as part of God or like as, as, yeah, as part of God that includes this kind of suffering, which isn't just like what you say, it's not suffering for nothing. It's, but it is part of the, like maybe of the nature. And that's, that's why as we get 
close, we kind of have to, part of participating in who God is, is participating in that part. But there's also all these other parts of God too. That's right. Well, it is. It's self-emptying love. I mean, and I think this is what's revealed to us from the incarnation on. He empties himself, takes upon himself our flesh, uh, becomes a servant, a slave, all becomes obedient even unto death. Uh, you know, part of the, the, the quality of divine love is this canonic aspect of it. It's self-emptying. And, uh, and so if we allow, and so the images that have been brought up here tonight of the breaking of the jar of ointment, you know, is so expressive of that reality of, of allowing oneself to be broken and poured out in love for others. This is what we, we are, are called to. And I think when Paul begins to preach the cross, it has such power because most of all, because it's preaching and it's proclaiming this very truth about God himself that speaks to the deepest part of a human being. If we're created in the image and likeness of God, then these words of truth spoken by Paul that speak of the deepest truth that has been revealed to us in the cross is going to speak to his hearers on the deepest level, even if they struggle with it and are confused by it, it's still going to speak to their hearts as those been, who've been created for God. Yeah, I mean, yeah. this makes sense, but um, I think the hard part is it's not always, um, it's not always very clear exactly like the fruit of, of a person's suffering. Often it's just, you know, going through like a dark night, for example, or, or whatever, any kind of thing that, doesn't seem to have any fruit in it. It's really, you almost feel like you're suffering for God or for a reason you don't understand. Yeah. And it, it, there's no love there. There's nobody that, you know, there's, there's no romance story there. This is the kind of, I think, hard question that I, I, I'm not sure it has an answer. I mean, you well, can, you, well, I don't think it's the responsibility. And I don't think the church can do that in terms of sense of providing people with easy answers. You know, it's an invitation to enter into the deepest mystery that God has revealed of himself to us and invited us to participate within it. And, you know, that we would think that we would be able to enter into that and see it clearly with the limitations of our intellect and understanding is not very realistic. It's in and through the gift of faith and in and through this relationship where we are strengthened by the grace of God, that he draws us more and more deeply into that mystery of love. And I had to learn a long time ago to allow people to walk away from this group confused and agitated and not understanding it and not to pretend that I understand it all either. Like there, there are no experts in the desert fathers and I'm certainly not, I'm certainly not one of them, even if there were. And, you know, so there is a kind of humble, humble approach that we have to have to all of this. If we were talking about the mysteries of God and of his love and of his revelation of himself, that it's we're going to learn more on our knees than from books. And we're going to learn more in the silence of prayer where God speaks to the depth of the heart than hearing some, you know, graying priest chatter on for an hour. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Good, great question. Great comments, too. Okay, folks, that brings us to 838. Uh, and so we'll pick up next week uh, with, uh, where do we leave off here? Number 12, right? So we'll pick up with number 12 next week. All right, thank you all. And won't we close with, as always, with the prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Father, 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 who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And St. John Climacus. Great Thank you all and happy feast day. Thank you, Father. Great thanks and have a wonderful night. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, Father. Okay. Happy feast day.